Yeah, thanks. Um, big words. I hope I can somehow make that true. Uh, yeah, this session is about vulnerabilities, and um, you might be surprised when you see the session because it's not about vulnerabilities in detail. But we will see that. Um, my name is Gerrit Grunwald. I'm working for Azure Systems as a senior developer advocate. I'm running the Java user group in Münster in Germany. So if there are any people that coming to Germany would like to talk at our user group, just ping me on Twitter. There's my handle, Hansolo underscore. All right. So I'm a developer, right? I'm not a security expert. Nevertheless, I will talk about security here. And the reason for that is November 24th in uh, 2021, there was this thing called Lock for Shell. So who was affected by that in the audience? Just don't be shy. Oh, OK, cool. Yeah, same for me. And that made me think, right? Because I will be honest with you, I never thought about security, honestly. For me, it was like, yeah, I create my code, throw it over the wall, the people build it, and then ship it and gone. Well, and I'm not so young anymore. And uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, when I started with computing or working with computers was 1982. And so that was in the 20th century. And the software landscape was totally different at that time. So code was self-written and closed source mainly. And source code was managed in a repository on a local server. And I even remember the times when it was not even in a repository, just folders copied and renamed and all these kind of things. Um, but that was the way it worked for us. And everything was built manually. So no build system or something in, in that case. Um, it delivered on hardware, really floppy disks and um, DVDs and USB sticks and these kind of things. And it ran on closed networks or on local servers. So it always locally, right, more or less. And it have been large monolithic systems. And the only connected systems have been in the government, in banking, and, and also in energy providers. So in the end, we had full control over the source code, right? Except you buy some libraries or some programs, but this was meant to be safe. You buy it in a store, so this is no problem. OK. And the vulnerabilities at that time have been password hacking, really like you go to the trash can and search for some paper, and oh, look, that looks like a password, stuff like that. And computer viruses, the first ones, they spread via floppy disks or USB sticks or something like that. And it was the early days of internet hacking, right? And then time flies, and it was November 24th in uh, 2021, and suddenly I realized, oh, it's the 21st century. So things changed a lot. We have a lot of open source software in use these days, and distributed source code management systems, this is normal, right? Nobody thinks about it even. It's just that's the way it is. We have automated build systems, CI, CD systems. It's hosted in artifact repositories somewhere on the web. It's running on public networks. It's accessible via browsers or APIs, and everything is connected. And we have no full control over the source code. But we don't care, right? I never cared about that. So today we have a whole software supply chain, which it's totally different from the last century, at least when everything started. OK. So the vulnerabilities also changed dramatically. So these days, a really big danger is social engineering. And if you don't know what it is, then look it up. It's really interesting. And um, who's using social networks here? Yes, you guys look it up what it is. You will have fun. And we have malware and ransomware everywhere. And if you can get a short message on your phone and you click a link and suddenly something goes wrong, right? So this is, uh, you don't really think about that. We might think about it, but think about your parents. They don't think about that kind of stuff. So everything that is connected will be hacked. That's, that's a fact. And sp spreading malicious code is easier than ever before. And the whole software supply chain, supply chain is target of attacks. And I will come to what is the software supply chain thing. Um, so first of all, we have to take a look at some definitions. And this is the reason why I created that session. Because when I stumbled upon this lock for shell stuff, there have been so many acronyms. The Americans are really good in creating acronyms. 
And I had no idea what it means. And everybody was talking because I'm working for an American company. And then people talked about all these things. And I was like, what the hell is that? I have no idea. So I looked that up. So there's, for example, CWE, which is a common weakness enumeration. And um, there's a, it's a community-developed list of software and hardware weakness types. You can find it here under the cwemetre.org link. And I think the slides will be made available afterwards. If not, then and you would like to have them, ping me and you can have it. Because I have lots of these QR codes with links to that stuff, so you can read it up. It's a lot of stuff to read. So this is the first one, and you will find that sometimes. When you find a vulnerability, you will find a CWE number, right? Then there is CVE. This is the most known thing, I guess, right? So it's common vulnerability and exposure. And the idea of the CVE program is uh, to identify, define, and catalog publicly disclosed cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Wow, that's so short. And uh, how it looks like, for example, for Lock4Shell, then the CVE code was this one, 2021, which is obviously the year, and then we have 40, 44, 228. So with this number, you can identify it, uh, uh, vulnerability. And then you find this kind of text. You don't have to read it. This is now, it contains the versions of this library that have been vulnerable, and the versions that are not vulnerable, vulnerable and it also contains some text to explain what exactly is the vulnerability of this specific version. So you can look that up, and there's also the link. And you already see in the link that there is this NVD thing, which is uh, the next thing that I would like to explain, because this is the National Vulnerability Database. And this database is from the US government, and it contains all these CVEs and all the information about it. So if you would like to look something up, and you have no idea where to start, then you go there. NVD, NIST, Gov. This is the, the NVD database, and you will find lots of information there. They even have an API. You can sign up for a key, and then you can use that in your code if you like. But it's, it's not so easy, but you can. Then there is CVSS, which is the Common Vulnerability Severity Score. Wow. And this is always in combination with the CVE. So you have a CVE, and this comes with the CVSS. And this is in the NVD. Oh, I love it. All these acronyms. It's terrible. And then we have two different versions of the CVSS. There's the 2.0 version, which has these three levels, like low, medium, and high. And the strange thing here is that even if you have zero vulnerability score, it's already low severity. And um, they changed that. Um, as far as I know, it's 2016, and they invented the 3.0 version. In the meantime, it's 3.1, and they gave zero none. So that means there is no vulnerability. And then we have also, in the, in the far end, we have now critical. Right? So you will find both uh, scores. Even in today's vulnerabilities in the CVE, you will find the 2.0 score. So just that you know there are two different scores. And if, you give, if someone gives you one score, you always have to ask, okay, which is it, CVE 2 or 3? and the CVSS. And this also you can look up there. You see the link. It's again in the NVD NIST Gov, and then it's a full metrics CVSS. So everything's defined there. OK. For Log4Shell, the CVSS 2 was 9.3, which was high. And the new one was critical. So and you see the highest score, 10. And there is a reason for that, as we all know. So the question is, is Java secure? Who's a Java developer, by the way? Uh, that's not obvious. Who does Kotlin? No one. OK, well, Ruby. JRuby. No. OK. Uh, that's good. Uh, Scala, someone? Someone heard of it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, so is Java secure? First of all, there's the Open JDK Vulnerability Group. This is one institution that should help to make it more secure. And it's a private forum of people that have been trusted members of the OpenJDK community. And you just can't go there and say, oh, I would like to sign up. I would be like to be part of it. No, it works differently. So they choose people, right? So it's, uh, it's really it's based on trust, which is a good thing. And they receive and review reports of vulnerabilities in the OpenJDK base, because you can imagine OpenJDK is written in Java, 
parts of it, right? So um, the code base also contains vulnerabilities, of course. And if someone reports that, then this uh, institution will take a look at it and review it. They won't fix it, right? So they collaborate on fixing the issues, but these are not the people that really fix the issues. They coordinate releases of such fixes, and they also maintain the list of CVEs. You probably saw that when you have a, you can look that up on openjdk.org. There is a list for each uh, update with the fixed CVEs in there, if there have been some. Right, so you can look them, look them up. And this is maintained by this institution. And they track CVEs by component because it makes sense. Right? We have now modular JDK versions. So who is using JLink and create is his own version of the JRE? This is really frightening. You should do that. Who's using a JRE? Ah, so what are you using in production JDKs? Nothing. OK, too shy. No problem. So you should use JLink, right? And we will come to that. And the reason is because not all Java users use all components, so it makes sense to track them, the CVs down to components. And uh, they also discuss open JDK security related issues and so on. And they does not actively test the open JDK source code, this institution. But this, it's there and it's good that it is there. Then we have the Java release cycle. It doesn't really sound like this is related to security, but we will see why that makes sense. So first of all, we remember these days, right? It took four and a half years from six to seven, and then three years from seven to eight. That was the old cadence, and then we switched to the new one, which is now much faster. We have a lot of different versions. We don't only, not only have LTS releases, which is long-term support versions. We have also STS releases, which short-term support versions. <clears throat> it's only for six months. But it gives you the opportunity to really test stuff before you come to the next LTS, and then you can use the LTS in production, and you should use LTS if possible. OK. So and you see that it switched from three years down to two years in the meantime. So the next version, JDK 21, for this year, September, we only have two years between LTS releases, which is even better. So you don't have to wait a long time for these uh, LTS releases. Why is it important? Because of this. If you see the features per release in the old cadence on the left side, you see it had been 56 for JDK 8 and 91 for JDK 9. The reason for 9 is obvious because we got the module system there. But you can imagine if you introduce so many features in one release, there's a huge opportunity that you have a lot of vulnerabilities in there. And it's hard to test that. Then you see the new release cadence, and you see the features that made it into the next version. And it's much lower, the numbers, which makes it more easy to test the stuff and make sure that it is secure, right? Less features per release means less potential vulnerabilities. So it makes sense. And that's the reason why the release cycle is an important part of the whole security thing within the JDK. And it's interesting that you see stuff like five new features. You think, wow, this is not really a lot. Depends on the feature, of course. But yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that this really makes sense when you look at security. The other thing is Java updates. And this is interesting because a lot of people don't really know that there are different ways of how to update in a JDK or what is available. So first of all, there is a so-called CPU, a critical patch update. And I have to ask, who has a Java subscription here? Java SE subscription or Azul subscription? Don't be shy. Um, just a few. Who doesn't have? OK. So all that don't have a subscription probably never saw the CPU release or CPU updates, because this is usually just available if you pay for it. What it is is it contains only fixes for vulnerabilities and critical issues. And that's it. Nothing more, right? So it's really safe to use that in production, because you can be sure that there have been no new features in that version. When we take a look at the next one, which is the PSU, and this is the one that you can download everywhere, then this is the patch set update, and that contains the CPU, but it also comes with fixes for non-critical issues, and it comes with new features. And you can imagine if you introduce new features in an update, there's a possibility that you also introduce new vulnerabilities that have not have been found yet, right? So the idea is if you pay for Java, doesn't matter who you pay for, but if you pay for it, you get the CPU updates. And if you are old enough 
And remember the old days where we had the Java 8? Who's using Java 8, by the way, in production? OK, 11? Cool, and 17? Yes, great, that's good. So in Java, Java 8, we, we saw on the Oracle page, you might remember this update, 8U251 and 252. This is exactly the PSU and CPU thing. And then they change the license again, like Oracle like to change the licenses and all these things. And then they take it away. So now you have to pay for it. And then you get the CPU. And the PSU is the stuff that you can download for free. For also for all the other vendors. It's only three vendors. I think it's Azul, Bellsoft, and Oracle that offer CPU releases. Everybody else only does PSU. All right, so it makes sense to use a PSU. And to show you how it works, it's, I try to visualize it. It's not so easy. We start in January. We get four times a year we get the updates. We start with 1701. And we see on the upper part, we see the PSU that also contains the CPU. And the blue part is the new feature stuff. And then we, on the lower part, we just have the CPU updates. <clears throat> so if we go now to the next update in April, then from 1701 PSU to 1702 PSU, we get the new features, right, and fixes. And the 1702 CPU only contains bug fixes from the 1701 PSU. It's a little bit complex, but with this, you can make sure that you only get the fixed version from the last PSU. This means the CPU is always a step behind, but it's more secure. That's the main idea behind it, right? And that goes on then for July and then also for October. And that's the recommendation. If you have mission-critical stuff in production, then you m might want to use a PSU, uh, a CPU instead of a PSU release. So this is, but it, that's up to you, just to let you know that this is available. And this could help also in terms of security for the JDK. Okay. So that means, just to give you an idea, if you don't update, and I also didn't update in the past, so the impact, if we take a look at JDK 11, so 11.0, it had six CVEs. Okay, then 11.01, two, three, four, five, there was only one fix, and then this five stick, stuck in the, in the open JDK release to 11.06, and then it was fixed. So from that moment on, there was nothing. And then 11.011, .11, there was another CVE coming. And then in 11.012, nine more. All right. And then in 13, it was all fixed again. And since then, it's OK. But if you now stick to 11, then you have 17 CVEs in your JDK. And these are not fixed. And we have eight low ones and nine medium. This is the vulnerability score. So you better update your JDK. It makes sense. You better check that. Because I, I didn't check that on my machine, but yeah, since that, uh, I do that. So if you work like that, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Better if it ain't broke, at least keep it up to date. Right? So it makes sense. Who's, who's doing regular updates on the JDK? On his private machine. You see? It's, yeah, do that. Makes sense, really, trust me. So the, the other thing is you can use modular runtime images. That's what I mentioned already. This is J-Link. It reducing, it's reducing the risk by removing modules, which makes sense, right? So J-Link make, makes that possible. And removing unused modules means reducing the risk for vulnerabilities. If you don't have XML in your JDK, then there's no way to really attack it, right? Just think about it. it. It makes sense. And in addition, you get a smaller JDK. So if you don't use J-Link, you should. It, it really, it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, hackers cannot attack what isn't there, right? So it, it's a really easy thing. OK, now that leads me to the software supply chain, which um, for me was totally new. I never thought about it. And uh, so it starts with us, with the developers. And usually, we get our stuff from some central repository. <coughs> And then we submit our code in our own repository. And from there, we build it with some CI CD system. And once we do that, the CI CD system also drags in stuff from the central repository because we might have transient dependencies from other libraries that we use. And then we build some containers out of it, right? 
and then we put them in an artifact repository. And this goes back to the central repository. So this is in principle how it works. And then we also go to production from there. Okay, that's cool. Um, it's a lot of things that are happening there. For us, it's just normal. But it also offers a lot of potential vulnerabilities. It sounds sometimes stupid, but it, this is just the fact. So you see here in the submit phase, you can have some then the repository itself, the build process, the build, the packaging, the artifact repositories, um, and even if you go back to the central repository, you can have attack vectors where you really have something that's, that's possible to hack. And we just take a look at some very easy things, like a hacker can pretend to be a known contributor and just submit bad code. So it sounds stupid, right? But it, this is what happens, right? People do that, and it works. So um, you could also take over a complete account and then just inject malicious code into the repository. And from there, it goes automatically. You saw the whole chain, right? You can retrieve passwords from build scripts. I saw that. I hope nobody has that in clear text somewhere in some script. That would be terrible. And because if you, once you get these passwords, you can just do whatever you like in the build process. And you can upload modified packages if they don't need to come from a trusted build system. Right? Also, this has to make, you make sure that this works as it should. And this is the obvious thing. Everybody from you really got at least one mail where it says, oh, this is your bank, and so sorry, you have to click this link to do something, and it looks exactly like your bank account. And this is also something which happens a lot. So be careful with this stuff. That's all obvious. Who's using open source here? Yeah, everybody, right? And then you know this thing. You don't have to read it. It just contains some very important words like is provided as is, right? Without warranty of any kind. And in no event shall the authors or copyright holders be liable for any claim damages or liability, right? Did you ever read that and understand what it means? This means I owe you nothing, right? That means you create code, put it out there, and you use that, and you, yeah, that's a license, yeah, 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 it's, it's whatever it is, I just read it, no problem. So, keep in mind, and this is exactly how it works, that uh, open source maintainers are not suppliers. Right? So you don't have a business relationship with them. They owe you nothing. Right? And if you use this code, it's up to you to make sure that it's secure and safe. You can't blame them. Because they made sure to say, OK, I'm out. If you use that, your turn. Right? Because we saw that after lock for shell People, how, how can they do that? Right? Wasn't it tested? It's not their fault. But this is how it works. And that's the, a big problem these days. People just trust everything. Is someone doing Node.js, NPM? This is terrible sometimes. And you see what, what these things drag in on modules, if you check the modules folder. And yeah, just, you just trust it. It's fine. Um, then we have this, this other paradigm, shift left. Who heard about shift left? Probably some people, right? So that means if we have the software supply chain, in the past it was really like I described it for me, like I created the code, I put it in the repository, and then we throw it over the wall, and someone build it for us, and I don't care. And that was a problem, of course, right? Because I was not aware about security issues and stuff like that. So what it means, we have the dev side on the left, and we have the ops on the right, and shift left just means the people on the left side should take more care about security. This is the whole movement of shift left. That's what it means. It doesn't mean it's only shift left, right? So if we take a look at DevOps, then it's now DevSecOps in the meantime. That came up over the last years. First was DevOps was the thing, and then suddenly DevSecOps is the thing. But what is it really? So if we take a look at this DevOps loop, then it starts with planning, coding, building, and then releasing. This is the dev cycle, and then it goes into deployment, which is more on the ops side, operate, monitor, and then back to planning. So this is how it works. So where's security here? 
It's everywhere. Security belongs to all of these things. It's not left or right or something, right? The security should be all over the place to make it right. So shift left, yes, but also validate right. And what that means, I will come to that later on. So I have some facts for you that I found on the internet, <clears throat> which is quite interesting. This is from the Sonatype State of Software Chain report. And it says that over the past three years, there was an increase in software supply chain attacks by 742%, which is huge. And another thing, this is from the, N, from the National Vulnerability Database, from the NVD. They also made some statistics, and you can see here on the very far, this is 2021, and they said just in this year, they saw 20,142 unique bugs and security vulnerabilities recorded. And you see that this is increasing. So software is in danger. If you don't take care about it, you will suffer from that. So another thing that I found quite interesting, Christian Grobmeier, who's one of the Log4j maintainers, he said in an interview for a German news magazine that even after 15 months after the bugs have been fixed in Log4j, in Log4j still 34% of all downloads downloaded the vulnerable version, still. Users are just lazy. They don't care. Or they don't know. That's the other thing. If you have a dependency that has another dependency and drags in the old version, you're vulnerable. Right? And I found that quite interesting. I mean, this is more than a year later after the, the issues have been fixed and still 34%, a third of all downloads are still downloading the vulnerable version of Log4j. Right? <clears throat> and this is one of, one of the reasons, probably. This is the transitive dependencies. That means you have a dependency on whatever library, and this library drags in something else, and you have no idea what it is. And this could be a vulnerability. And you see that is also from the Sonatype State of the Software Chain report, that six out of seven project vulnerabilities coming from transitive dependencies. So, not good. And there is this other report, which is the Synopsis Open Software Security and Risk Analysis Report, and they found out that they scanned code bases, and they found that open source found in 96% of all scanned code bases. And 76% of the code that they scanned have been open sourced. Right? That was open source code, which is interesting. So source code, open source is everywhere, and we just trust it, more or less. And then they also said that um, at least one vulnerability was found in 84% of all scanned code bases. And 48% contained a high-risk vulnerability. That's half of it. Just imagine, right? Could be you, could be every second person in the room. And that's, that's critical. And who's really thinking about it? Uh, to be honest, I'm not. I'm writing code. I'm not thinking about this kind of stuff. But it was shocking when I saw that. So the question is, what can we do? What's the solution for that, right? <clears throat> First of all, you can update your JDK. Do that. And there are tools. There's, for example, SDK Man. Who's using SDK Man? Yes, cool tool. Uh, by the way, who's running on Windows here? Sorry, no SDK Man for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, SDK Man supports many JDK distributions. And now I get this nice pop-up in my screen here. Oh, sorry, what's that? Ah, okay, so um, it's command line only, and it's only for Linux and Mac. And it downloads and installs JDK and can also keep it up to date, which is great, right? So you can just, I, I don't use it, because I would like to have full control over where my JDKs are installed, so I never use it, but uh, I like the idea. So I created my own tool which is called JDK Mon, and this was mainly because I'm lazy and I, I really hated to look up the websites from the distributions and check if there's a new version available because I don't know the release date by heart. So I created that tool and first I just checked distributions if there are updates and then I figured out, oh, that's nice, I can do more. Um, so it supports more or less all JDK distributions, also GraalVM, also OpenJFX, and this is more than 20 different distributions. And it's a taskbar application, you can install it and it will sit in your taskbar and will check in the background if there are updates available and you can just update the, your JDK. And it's for Windows, Linux and Mac because it's a Java tool. And it also checks for vulnerabilities of the Open JDK distribution. 
And I use just the NVD to look that up. So, and this is how it looks like, right? So you have your window, it shows you all the versions. If there is an update, it shows you the version that is available, you can just click and it, you have to install it because I like to install the stuff in specific folders. But if there's a problem, you see this red thing with the attention mark there, the uh, exclamation mark. If you click that, you will get this. <clears throat> it shows you the CVEs for this selected JDK. And you can click on the CVE and it will show you the, the text for the CVE. So if you can look it up. So um, with this, you can check if your installed OpenJDK distribution is vulnerable. And even if it is vulnerable, you can't change it. You can at least look it up. What are the vulnerabilities here? Right? So yeah, this is just a free tool. You can download it. I just did it really because I'm lazy. The other thing that you can do is static code analysis. Who's doing that? Awesome. That's good. So it's usually part of a code review, like white box testing. It identifies vulnerabilities in source code at the implementation phase, right? That's very inexpensive because you can still change it easily. It's no problem. And there are standalone tools, and there are also IDE plugins. And this is a list that I found on the NIST side. This is not the best list. This is just the list that they say, this is, these are tools that you can use, right? And you see some are free, some you have to pay for. Some have a paid version and a free version. And um, if you take a look at find security bugs, and that's uh, in principle, it's free of charge. It's a spot box plugin, ex extends spot box, and spot box is the successor of find box, if I'm right. And it uh, detects more than 400 bug patterns is a plugin. And um, this is how it looks like. You have a bug explorer on the left side. This is, I think, an eclipse. And then it just shows you, okay, th there's a problem here. You can do that in a different way. It helps you to write more secure code, which is nice. So you can use it, and it's for free. Um, then there are vulnerability scanners. That's a little bit more advanced, right? They detect vulnerabilities in all kinds of places, right? Not only in the IDE, in your code. And they use usually a database, or they have common vulnerability patterns that they apply to your code and check if it's vulnerable or not. And they monitor misconfiguration and coding flaws, help using only artifacts from reliable sources, <clears throat> it helps using only latest secure version, right? Which is also very nice. And the appearance of new packages with fixed vulnerabilities. So they tell you, oh, there's a fixed version for this package, for example. And they can update dependencies, which is great. And how they work, they work on all these places in source code, on the repository level, in the CI CD system, in the artifact repositories. They can also scan that. They also can run on production but usually that's an agent. And now I have to ask you, who is running vulnerability scanners in production here? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's typically not that many people because they just trust uh, if, it, if it was okay in the CI CD system, then it will work in production, right? This is what usually happens. And the other thing is there is an agent. If, it, if an agent is running at the same time, it has an overhead. If we take a look at an agent, what is an agent? Then if this is the JVM, then this is not a black box like it's here. It's, it has all these kind of different modules, like the class loading subsystem, JVM memory, execution engine. And for example, the class loading thing is interesting. And it also comes with an API. It's a so-called instrumentation API. And this can be used by an agent. Right? Agent is just some code that is running and that can talk to the JVM using this API. And for example, what it can do, it can have a callback that every time when the class loader is loading a class, it will call back to the agent. And then the agent can do something and scan it, for example. But you can imagine that this takes time. This is really a performance overhead, at least 10%. And if you run your stuff in a cloud environment, then you have to pay for this 10% performance, right? So we have a different, here's a list of some vulnerability scanners uh, for Java development. We have also one, and there's Black Duck, X-Ray, Sneak, <coughs> SonarCube Privy, and there are lots more. Even there are free ones and paid ones. For example, if you take a look at Sneak Code, this is an IDE plugin from Sneak, and uh, it's, they have a free and a paid version. They support more than nine languages. They have some developer-first approach, which means this is this kind of shift-left thing, right? So it's for us. It's not for the ops guys. 
And it's the standalone tune and also has an IDE plugin. So you can use both of that. And it also has CI CD integration. It doesn't come with production uh, support, right? And this is what it looks like. So it can show you where's the problem. This is a JavaScript version here. It can show you really in the code where's the problem and what is the problem. It can explain to you this is an SQL injection and this is the problem why you shouldn't use it, right? This is the reason. <clears throat> this is sneak code. Then we have SonarCube. Very similar. They have a free and paid version, more than 30 languages, so they are really big in security, more than 4,800 analysis rules and um, standalone and IDE plugins available, and also comes with CI CD integration. It looks very similar. This is unfortunately really hard to read, but it's not that important. It just shows you where's the problem, what is the problem, and why is it a problem. Right, so it's, it's the main idea, right? So they show you something if it's an IDE plugin, and in principle, it works in the same way if you use it on a repository or in, a, um, in, in something else in the build process, for example. They just scan everything and give you some report, which is nice. But again, the problem is production. So we saw that problem. We also created one. This can only do Java. It can only run in production. And the idea is a little bit different because it doesn't have any performance overhead here. So um, we do fingerprinting CVEs, and that gives you, in the end, a few or false positives and because we don't have a Java agent. Because we're doing the JVM, we work on the JVM, what we did is the JVM is loading all the classes anyway, right? So the JVM can just tell us what classes have been loaded. You don't need an agent to do that. So what we did, we just created a so-called forwarder that sits in your infrastructure, and then the JVM loads stuff, and from time to time it just tells the forwarder, here, this is the stuff that I loaded. And the forwarder then just checks for vulnerabilities. And that means we can do that in production without an overhead. And this is what we give you. The, either a web UI, or we just offer you an API so that can be integrated in other tools. So it shows you, for example, which dependencies do you have. And then it shows you, is this dependency vulnerable or not with the CVSS score, for example. And the most important part, and this is what is different here, we can tell you if you use it really, right? And that's the big difference. If you scan and see ICD, we can just scan, oh, we have a dependency on log 4 shell ooh, that's vulnerable, right? We can tell you, yes, you have a dependency on log4j, but we can tell you if it's used. If the JVM ever loaded the classes, if not, you are not in danger. I mean, you should change something, of course, but at least you are not in danger at that moment. So this is the difference, right? Uh, come on. Okay, it doesn't work anymore. So if we take a look at a secure software supply chain, how could it look like? This is our supply chain, and then we usually have third-party stuff like Spring or Log4j and we also use these big things like Kafka, Cassandra, Elasticsearch. We can use code scanners on the development side. We have different options there, and we can also use CI-CD code scans in the CI-CD system. And of course, there's also container scanning software. Who, who's scanning containers here? Yeah, a few. Yeah, yeah there are tools to do that, so it's, it's quite helpful. And so we just propose that you can use a rule on the right side, right? So this is what I mean with validate right, because we shift left, yes, that's okay. We trust the CI-CD build system, no. We validate that that what the CI-CD system tells us is correct on the right side. This is what I mean with validate right. So the takeaway, and I have no idea how I'm doing in time. Maybe I'm too fast. So you should follow an automated patch schedule. Right, in line with the OpenJDK vendor, with the quarterly updates. So you should really do that. That makes a lot of sense. And automate application packaging with JLink. Really do that. It's, it helps a lot. It keeps the size of the JREs really small, and it helps to reduce the, let's say, the possibilities of vulnerabilities. Watch for CVEs and libraries. Right? So it, if you have some of these tools, and like I told you, these are free. Most of them are free. You can use them at least on your own machine, on the developer machine. They will tell you if you have dependencies and there are vulnerabilities. Check it up 
see if they're really critical things. And if they are critical things, then look for updates, right? And these tools also help you to find the updates. And use vulnerability scanners. And not only in development in CI CD, also use it in production because in it, at runtime, you can introduce more code. You can load code at runtime and you have no idea what's going on. You might be vulnerable without knowing it. So, do you need to be a security expert? Probably not, right? But you need to be aware that this kind of things are there and that they are dangerous. And it gets more dangerous every year. I never thought about it, but I saw the statistics and it's really frightening when you see that. So with this, I just say stay secure. And if you have questions, I, I still, we have still have five minutes left. So if you have questions, you can ask them now. Otherwise, I will be around. You can ask me later on if you like. And um, that's it. Thanks for attending.